In this video, we're going to look at how to take data you've captured with your telescope and turn it into beautiful solar images. We're going to show how to start with data like this and turn it into beautiful photos like this. We'll look at both white light and hydrogen alpha examples. The first tool you want to start with is called AutoStacker, and this is free software you can download for Windows not for Mac. You want to be sure you have the latest version. Take the file that you're interested in and simply drag it up into the window and it will open. You need to put this image stabilization anchor around an interesting surface feature which would be one of these two sets of sunspots in our case here. So I'm going to say control click here and I can change the size of this green window by pressing on my keyboard, control and a number. So here's control three, control four, control five, control six, control seven. I'm gonna say control four in this case. You want to be set for surface when you're looking at the sun. You want to have improved tracking turned on. You want to be set for cropped. And under the quality estimator, Laplace should be set for a number proportional to the quality of your data. I know that my data here is a good average but not great, so I'm going to call it normal, which would be four. Typically with solar you'll be set to four or perhaps three if you have really good data. Our next example will be a set to three, but this one we're going to call it four. Set to local and then you click analyze. The software is going to go through and look at every one of the uh, 3016 frames that we have here and then it will rank them in order. And so as I move this slider along I can see from best to worst what the frames look like. There's the worst frame and there's the best frame. Also you can see this quality graph and this quality graph shows you how good the data is. In this case coincidentally about half the data is above the 50 percent line. What I like to do when I'm looking at how many frames to stack is look at where the green line crosses the 75 percent bar which is right here. In this case we have if this is 25%, we have maybe 5 or 10% at this point. Typically, with white light, you're always going to want to stack a small number of frames, 5 to 10%. I'm going to say 5% in this case. And we do not want to do sharpening. We're going to do sharpening later at a different uh, setup. I'm looking at the frames to stack. I could also say, let's look at 5 and 10 and 15, and the software would actually do all three stacks consecutively. I give you the results together. Or I could say instead, I don't want to look at 5%, I want to look at the top 100 frames. You can do it that way as well. You can do both, and it will give you the results to both. In my case, I'm simply going to set for 5%. That should be turned off. Let's hit that by mistake. Uh, drizzle, generally, you leave off. If you have very high quality data, in other words, if this green line crosses over a 75% level and it's out here, you might want to turn drizzle on to improve your result. Also for double stack reference, this should always be off unless you're doing planetary or if you have extremely high quality data, but it will extremely increase the amount of time it takes to do processing. So if you don't care about time, then you'll get a better result, but it won't be a, a big difference. It'll be a subtle difference. The output is going to be a TIFF. And once you're ready, you can press place AP grid. You want to be set for replace and multi-scale. Number of points you want to have here could be 24 or 48. I'm going to go with 24 because I've got enough processing power to, I don't care about how many points I have. If you have an underpowered PC, 48 might be better. I wouldn't go any higher than that or you'll lose some quality. Generally speaking, the more points you have, the higher the quality you'll have, but the longer it will take to get a result. So there's the grid attached and then I can simply press stack and the software is going to go through and do the reference frame alignment stacking map analysis combination and then we're done and it automatically drops the, the data into a folder which will be called uh, ASP5 for 5%. Now let's look at another example with hydrogen alpha data. So I'll grab my hydrogen alpha file and I'll drag it up here and now we can see the data. It's a bit too big for the screen so we're going to decrease the size so that we can get it all in. There we are. Uh, in this case, there's a sunspot here. There's some an active region there. I'm going to pick this sunspot region for my anchor point. 
And as I mentioned before, uh, this is a little higher quality data. I'm going to set my noise robustness to three, which is high signal to noise ratio. Other things are the same. I'm going to have double stack reference turned on in this case, as well as drizzle at 1.5. I probably would never do drizzle at 3.0, but 1.5 is good. Uh, let's just do the analysis first, and we will whip through the 1,000 frames and see what kind of a quality graph we come up with. All right, so this data is pretty good. So this is 75, this is 100, so this is like 87, 88%. Very, very high quality graph, which of course I knew in advance, which is why I turned on drizzle and uh, double stack reference. We're not going to turn on sharpening. Here, my experience has been that if you have very high quality data, you don't need as many frames to stack to get a great result. So I'm going to say 12% in this case to give us a new folder of the data is going to be stacked. One thing we didn't show yet on the previous example, which is more applicable for hydrogen alpha, is you might wonder whether there's any activity going on here, any prominences and so on. Well, what you can do is you can go under display options and you can increase the brightness 2x, 4x, 8x. Well, surprise, there's some activity. So you can see a prominence here, a little bit of activity over there. This isn't going to affect the data you look at, but it tells you where it is. So what I would do is I would have my settings set for 24 and replace and multi-scale. When I place the grid in this case, the software did happen to find it there. You could change the maximum brightness. If this had been set for 15 and I did this again, it wouldn't have seen the prominence. So I'm going to change this down to five again and replace it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the brightness and be sure that I've captured all of the prominence. And if you miss some of it, it's very easy to simply go in and add extra manual points. So you can just drop as many of these as you want in there. And that's going to increase your ability to capture the detail on the uh, prominence that was there. So once you're happy with that, in this case, I've got 10,375 points to stack. I can say stack. And oh, I left my uh, display on. But not to worry, this is not going to wreck your result. It's just a display option. It's not actually processing the data with that high brightness. So I will turn that back down again after we're done. You'll see, even though I have an i9 processor and lots of RAM, it's still taking a while to get through this data because I've got the double stack and drizzle turned on. All right, so I'll turn this brightness back down. And that's where we should be. So we've now saved a file. You'll see this folder popped up, ASP12, and that's where our result is going to be. The most popular program is Registax, which is free for Windows only with no Mac support. Registax is great for sharpening planetary images, and it's okay for white light solar as well. But I find after comparing both bits of software on the same data, I get a better result when I look at software called IMPPG. This is another free program for Windows that you can download. IMPPG uses a deconvolution filter as opposed to wavelet sharpening. And for the sun, it tends to give better results. So what we would do is we let's look at the file. That's going to be right here. There's our example. I can make it look a lot bigger. First thing you want to select is this square, which is a process the whole image. You see that the only part that's being processed right now is a center box. So we click this to do the whole image at once. And now we have a first look at the whole image. You can see the tone window off to the left. We're going to start with the tone window. One of the things you want to check is look at settings and processing back end and be sure that your graphics card is selected. I have a GPU and that's what's being used. So I'm all set. We're going to look at the tone curve over here. You can expand it for a little larger resolution if you want. With white light this has less of an effect. We're going to spend a lot more time with the tone curve with hydrogen alpha, but you can see that by moving this point around you can increase or decrease the brightness of the image. So for white light, I generally only have one point, and I maybe drop it a little bit to give a bit more of a 
gradient of brightness, uh, bottom left corner to the top right corner. And now we're going to go back to the deconvolution settings. You want to always have this prevent ringing turned on and set for between 50 and 70. I usually set it for 70 iterations. The first thing I do is I take the amount of unsharp and I raise it to a too high level. So you can see that the quality of the sunspot is terrible there. That's too much. Maybe it's even far too much. And now I'm going to work with the uh, uh, Lucy Richardson deconvolution amount. And this is one where a little bit goes a long way. So what you do is you start backing it off until you have a better looking result. This is a situation where you know, less is more. You really get a better result with a lower number. I'm typically between 0.7 and 0.5 with this setting. So I'm going to raise it a bit more. And this is again a judgment call. You can certainly increase the, the resolution and have a little closer look at these uh, sunspots if you want. But I'm going to call out around uh, 0.68. And then the next thing we'll do is we'll play with the unsharp masking sigma. And again, as you move this back and forth, you will see the detail appear and disappear. We don't want to over sharpen. That's a, a major concern that you can have and it's easy to do. You're going to do more sharpening in the next step. So you want to get this part way there but still leave some room for the next software to do its thing. So we're going to call that about uh, 1.39. And then we go back finally to the unsharp masking amount. And again, here you can go way too much if you want to. So I'm going to back it off to about there and we'll do the rest of the sharpening in the next bit of software. So in this case, I'm done. I can save it. Okay, so we're going to call it 12% white light example, if I can spell, and we'll hit save. Now let's look at the hydrogen alpha example. So we're going to load up our 12% example we had from before. There it is. There we are. And we're going to start with the tone curve. You'll typically see this appearance where you have a sharp peak on the left and a valley, and then a mountain, and it falls off to the right. And you want to adjust your first point so it's midway across the valley, and then drag it up to make the prom start to appear. Now what you want to do is not blow it out too much so that you, you have too much white in the background. You want to have some, some black background and some detail. So we're going to work from left to right here. And one of the questions you have to decide is whether you want to look, have the sun look like it's a normal setting or you want to have it inverted. Many solar images are inverted where the filaments and the cooler areas appear dark against uh, the background instead of bright. I often find this provides more contrast and gives a pleasing image. So let's look at how to do that. The simplest way is to grab this point on the upper right and drag it down to the left. And then as we add points, here, I'll just do a quick and dirty to start. You can see that this active region now is dark and the sunspot, uh, sunspot is dark. And now I'm going to play around here. Now I want to have enough detail that I can see some of this feathery uh, spicules as well as the prominence, but I don't want to blow it out too much that we get too bright. So again, we're just going to play around with it a bit. And you can add lots of points. If you have an extra point that you don't want, you can right click on it to make it disappear. You can also drag it along. You can have too much brightness there, which is what happened in that case. So I'm going to drop that down. And I'm just going to, you can spend a lot of time on this, obviously, but we're not going to do that. I'm just going to kind of get to it. I want to get some nice gradient there. If I pull this down a little bit, you'll see that the upper right corner it's a little darker, so we get more of a 3D effect, which is great. So this is a reasonable first start. We're going to come back and check on it later. But after we've finished with the, the tonal curve, the next thing for us to do is to go back and look at deconvolution and masking. So we're going to, again, set our amount to a high number here. So now we're going to go back to our sigma like we did before. And maybe I'll have a bit more of a zoom so I can see this a bit better. We can 
try playing with this and see where it gives us a better result. Again, we do not want to over sharpen. That's way over sharpened. So I think we can go somewhere within 0.1 of this 0.65. Further, you want to push it as far as you can before you start to lose quality. So again, it's a judgment call. We're going to call it 0.75 roughly. We want these to be on and I'm going to move this back up to 70 like I talked about with the white light example. And now we're going to play with the unsharp masking sigma. And again, you got over sharpened there, not bad there, maybe under sharpened there. So we're going to play around a bit until we get it to the point where it's just kind of feathery, but not too sharp. And then finally, we go back to the amount. And again, I can sharpen it far more than that, but that's way too much. So it's again, your judgment call. You're going to do again more sharpening in the next step. But this is, this is probably a reasonable point there. I'm going to call that 0.65. It's rare to get up this high, I should tell you. I've got exceptionally good data in this case, but uh, often you're closer to 3 to 5. That's where you might end up with. But we can do, we can do a bit better, I think. So we're going to call that 5.7. All right, now the last step I would do is I would go back to the tone curve again and be sure that after making our other adjustments, things still look good. So I want that prominence looking good. I want to make sure I see these feathery little spicules on the edge of the limb. And you can see how this setting is affecting the very edge of the limb. And again, try to make these, these look as smooth as you can as you move along. can do some things in the next step to, to soften this bright line a bit too. Don't bring it too far in, it gets too dark and too far up, it's too bright. You want the Goldilocks zone so you've got enough brightness to see some detail. And again, if you look for the curve to be smooth, that's generally going to give you the best result. Okay. We're pretty good there. So I'm going to call that good. Um, I can uh, I can hide this tone curve or just move it out of the way so you can see the whole rest of the sun. And I think at this point, we're ready to move on and look at the next bit of software, which is what's going to give us uh, detailed post-processing and allow us to do things like change color, adjust levels, work on contrast, and do a little bit more final sharpening. And just to show you the other way the sun could look, I'm going to make this tone curve a little smaller and now I'm going to uh, reset my tone curve and we're going to leave this upper point to the right and do the same sort of work we did before and so you can see in this case a very different kind of a curve and it's personal preference you might find you prefer this look this is the normal look the one that I did before is the inverted look you can see the contrast of the two if you want to just go back in the video there's lots of great post processing packages out there Photoshop is probably the most popular I use affinity photo which is very much like Photoshop, except it's a small fraction of the cost and has no subscription fee, just a one-time payment of $55. It's also compatible with both Mac and Windows, and not strictly relevant to this discussion on the sun, but it also has available an incredible set of astrophotography-related macros that make it a tremendous software package for astrophotography. You can see these are all different macros that are available for proposed processing of nebulas and galaxies and things like that. So you might want to check that out. I'll cover that more in a different video looking at uh, nebula processing. All right, so assuming you've got your software, you have to open up the data. And a lot of what I'm going to show here is going to be applicable to Photoshop because the functions are very similar. So I'm going to open up the file. And the first thing you need to look for is a white light example. Let's start with that. And there we are. You may want to be sure that you've shut down 
your IMPPG and your auto stacker to release some memory and speed things up. The first thing I do is I set levels. So you can go up under layer and new adjustment layer, levels, or simply press control L on the uh, keyboard. So what I see here is there's a great deal of room here where I can just drag this across and improve the levels. I'm going to talk about using Topaz Denoise optional software, but I generally find it doesn't do a lot for white light photos. It's very good for hydrogen alpha. So we're going to skip that for now. I'm going to flatten my image, create a new pixel layer, and change it from gray to 32-bit color. Now I'm going to go to the tone map function. And I've already set this up for 20% detail. What we're looking at here is a similar function in Photoshop called HDR. And it's basically a fine sharpening. And it's about 20%. Now, with Affinity Photo, you can, I've got a variety of things you can adjust here. So you can do tone compression, which you might decide you want to bring out some of this uh, granulation on the limb a bit more. You can do that. Uh, I'm going to do a small amount of tone compression here, but not much. Maybe uh, 17%. You can change the contrast. I can bring out some more detail. That's, that's, that's too much, I think, but a bit of that is helpful. I generally skip over exposure, black point, and brightness. This contrast, I might only do 1% at most to darken the outside, but that's about it. 0 to 1%. And saturation and vibrance are applicable because we're in black and white. I don't adjust white balance or shadows and highlights, generally speaking, with uh, white light photos. And then here we have radius and amount of sharpening for detail refinement, like the HDR function in Photoshop. And I find 20% is a good setting. So we'll say apply to that. And now if I want to do some additional sharpening around the sunspots, I can open up a new live filter layer. I can say sharpen. There's two ways I can do that. One of them is to go to the clarity function. I'm going to bring up this level from a daughter layer above the pixel layer. And then I can just drag this to the right. And it's way over sharper in this example. But again, it's one of these things where you want to have a, have a nuance. If I want to have a little close up here, I can hit control plus a couple of times, to see more details on the sunspots. So if I want to add a little bit of sharpening, you can see it's affecting the, the background as well as the sunspots. The whole image is being affected. Uh, let's just take this up maybe uh, 11%. And I can say Merge. And that's in. Now what I can also do is I could do instead, I could do a Sharpen Unsharp Mask. And if I use an Unsharp Mask, Again, I'll drag this up above the pixel layer. I could set this radius for between, between 5 and, and 20 pixels. Leave the factor at 0.5 and threshold at 0 to 1%. This appears way over sharpened because I've already sharpened with the first filter technique. So I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to delete this function. just wanted to show you how you would do it. All right, at this point, we're pretty close to being done. It's faster than with the HA example, which we'll get to next. So here's the entire picture. Now we want to add some color. So the best way to do that is to open up a new layer, a new adjustment layer. And in this case, you want to open up curves. And you can use levels, but I find with curves, you get more of a 3D gradient appearance. So first what we'll do is we'll start with a red layer and we'll grab the red line and drag it up about that far, say. And this is a judgment call. Colors are very personal preference. You generally want to have your sun be a nice yellowy orange color. So you could see a color like that you might like. Something like that is good. And you don't want to clip that at the bottom, so let me bring that up a little bit. Now what I've done, I've also created a macro called Color Sun, which makes it happen in one step. But uh, you can see here you've got a nice gradient from the limb of the sun up to the more of the center, and you can see the sunspots. So there's our final picture of the white light sunspots. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got something out of it. 
And now let's uh, open up the next picture, which is the hydrogen alpha example, and we'll see a few more things we can do to uh, make that look good. All right, so let's open up our hydrogen alpha example. Roll folder. There we are. Now, the first thing I do just for aesthetics is I'm going to flip the image because it just looks better to me with the prom at the top. Okay. Now, following the same sort of a process that we looked at before, first thing I'm going to do is go to Levels, which would be Control-L. And I can see there's a lot of area I can clip off here to get some blackness back without losing any detail on the picture. So we'll do that. And I can also raise this the same way for the plus side. All right, so my levels are adjusted. And now when that's done, next thing I want to do is, I'm in this case going to look at uh, topaz denoise. Now topaz denoise has to be done with 16-bit color. So I'm going to go to a 16-bit color adjustment. And then I've adjusted topaz denoise to be a, a plugin. So I'll say plugins, topaz labs, topaz denoise. And it's going to open up a separate software. And what you can do with Topaz Denoise is you can look at four different denoise algorithms at once. So in this case, I've got standard, clear, low light, and severe noise all being processed together. And I can compare how the sun looks with each of these four ways. Generally, what I find is severe noise is almost always too much. And you can adjust these settings for each one to be the recommended setting. Make sure these are all set for recommended. So we've got standard, clear, low light, and severe noise. And what I do is I look at the active region areas to see how this looks. This looks pretty good. This looks pretty good. Uh, look at the detail in the prom. Look at the spicules along the edge. They look a little feathery and nice little spikes. I'm not seeing a big difference between some of these processing methods. Generally speaking, the low light one gives us the best result when looking at uh, astronomical types of objects. Sometimes standard or clear is a bit better, but generally speaking, low light, if you're not sure, is a good one to pick. So I'm going to go back to the side-by-side -side view with low light, and then I can play with some of these adjustments. I can increase the sharpness and then do a comparison side-by-side -side of these two, and I can increase the zoom so I can look at the difference between pre-processing and post-processing. And you can see here that this is much sharper than it is here, and that there's more detail along the limb than there is up here. It's a bit more grainy. And look at the, the dark sky here. It's kind of grayish, and there it's smoother and black. And let's take a look at the prom and see how that compares. There's some noise here we'll get rid of in a minute. But wait for this to update. OK, so this does look a bit better. Um, you generally don't want to increase the noise adjustment too much because that can give you some smoothed out areas and lose detail. So I'm, I'm going to move that back. It's going to show a difference. But let's move that back to where it was down closer to 30, 25, 30 percent. And we're going to call that good. I'm going to say apply. And it's going to make those adjustments to the picture. And then it's going to drop that back. OK, so now we've got the uh, that sharpening done. I'm going to now go after doing a new pixel layer to look at tone mapping again, like we did before. And first thing I'll look at is tone compression and see what that does. You can see it's bringing up some, some artifacts in the background, but those are easy to correct. We'll do that in a few minutes. Um, it's making the problems look a bit brighter. So that, that's actually pretty good there. You can also do local contrast adjust if you want. That's bringing, you can see that's bringing a little more detail as well in. So those are some good adjustments to make. Um, I might try increasing this to 1%. The background can get darker. There's 3%. Well, maybe a bit more. It's maybe too much. 2%, I think, is an improvement. I'm not going to do anything about saturation or vibrance. I'm not going to look at white balance or shadows and highlights in this example. And we'll leave this at 20%. And we'll say apply. And there we are. I don't think in this case we're going to need to do any additional sharpening. We've done a fair bit already. I can simply go back over to the layer section and new live filter layer and select sharpen and clarity. 
and I can bring this up again and then I can increase the sharpness or decrease the sharpness on the whole image. Now what you might say is, well, some of the surface just below the limb doesn't look as crispy as it could be. So I'm going to raise this up a little bit. Then I can do a little trick here with invert layer and that basically turns off what I just did. I can go to the paintbrush tool and then I can paint back in some of that sharpness just where I want it, which is just along the limb. I should adjust the opacity to be higher. And I can paint this in here. Restore a little more sharpness just under the limb. I could also do it on the prom if I wanted to, and I could do it over here in this area. Give that a bit more sharpness. I do it anywhere I want. This allows you to do selective sharpening where you want. Finally, now we're going to get rid of some of these little spots we don't like. So that's a function that we use the what's called the in painting brush tool. And then once I have set a new pixel layer up, I simply just click on the offending spots and they are erased. So we'll get rid of all these little spots we don't like. Okay, and then that looks good. Now you may find that the background here has another spot, has become a bit brighter in certain areas. So there's a few things we can do if we want to make that dark again. One thing we can do is we can select this part of the image and then darken what's behind it. Or we can use one of the, the automatic filters that's in the software. And one of those filters is reduced background luminosity. And you can see it got darker and darker and darker and darker. So that's one technique. Another technique I can erase all those is I'm going to select the sun and then darken what's not in the sun. So let's see how we do that. Going to the selection brush tool. Want to select the sun. Let's grab all this good stuff right on the edge. Okay, now when it comes to the prominence, that's a bit trickier. So, what I'm going to do is change my brush size to be a lot smaller and just drag it up around that and take it and get this little tiny little bit there too. And then, what I can do is I can go to subtract and make it smaller still and subtract. It's a little spot there, and it's a little spot there. All that good enough for now. Now, obviously, if you're doing this very carefully for a long period of time, you may want to take a little more care. I'm just giving us a quick example. You guys can see how to do that yourself. I'm going to drag along here, and now we've got some activity going on here. I'm just going to grab some of this stuff, and then I'm going to subtract with a smaller brush, some of this area that is not flame or plasma technically. I'm going to add that little bit back in again. Click add properly. There we go. Spot. Okay, let's look at the whole sun here. And so I've got that all selected. Now what I want to do is I want to go to select and invert pixel selection. Now I've got the upper black part selected. And then I can simply do a control U and reduce the luminosity of that area that's been selected. And we end up with that. Now you see the problem we've got here is it's too sharp of an edge. So we're gonna go back here, I'm gonna turn off, delete this function and what I should have done is feathered the edge. So I'm going to give this about a 
44 pixel feathering. And that's going to smooth off this transition here, it won't be so stark. So now, after I've applied that adjustment, and I go back and do my luminosity reduction, it's not quite as severe. Let's say, done, done. Here we are. Now we finally need to color this image. So to do that, we're going to again open up our curves with a uh, Control M selection. And we're going to pick the uh, red layer and bring that up. Something like that. And then we're going to grab the blue and bring that down. And this actually looks pretty good. But sometimes this area right along the limb is very white and you want to be able to fix that. And one technique I learned from Simon Tang is to use this green level and bring this up just a skosh there and bring it down. There we are, bring it down about there. And that gives you kind of a gentle S curve on the green line and that will give you a little better color definition along the limb. So there we have our final picture and I hope you got something out of that. It was fun for me to put together and I look forward to seeing the photographs that you guys can produce taking pictures of the sun. Thanks for watching. If you liked it, give me a like and subscribe. I'll do more of these for deep space objects coming up in the future. Thanks.